Alright guys, we're going to run through the two main guns real quick. Start off with the Glock. So it's a pretty much completely stock Elite Force Glock 19. Um, on the frame, only thing that's changed is a magwell. This magwell doesn't really fit on here right. It does wobble a little bit. But the screw on the back still fits. Pretty much just slammed it on. And it's been working pretty good for now. Um, only other thing that's been changed is my valve knocker broke. Um, in the middle of quarantine, we were out here running drills in the arena, and it just snapped off. Um, there was a big chunk missing out of it, and it wasn't even a like a brand new replacement part we put in or an upgrade part. Um, we had one in the boneyard bin that wasn't at least snap in half, so we took that, put it in here. Now it's good again. Um, works fine. So everything is stock. Just that one boneyard piece was put in, so it wasn't even a new part. Just one that wasn't completely shredded. On the upper, um, you can see it's pretty worn down on the barrel here, some marks up on the slide, and then we just removed the orange tip. It does have threads, but I'm not going to put a thread protector or a muzzle device, anything like that on there. Um, everything in the blowback unit is the same. Didn't change the springs, didn't put a new nozzle in, anything like that. Then the barrel, again, it's pretty worn down right here, pretty worn down on the top. And then the locking lugs on the side right here are completely gone. So normally you'd have a fin here, and these fins would be a lot higher up. Um, but I don't know if you can see it. This is all worn down right here. This is worn down. This one's completely snapped off. Um, it still works fine. Gun runs like normal. It's just you should have a fin here, and then bigger fins here. They're just really worn down. Um, same interbarrel it came with, same bucking it came with. I've just cleaned it out um, once. I've cleaned the whole gun probably once, maybe twice. Um, and that's pretty much it for that. That's everything stock. It's nothing special on here. Just the basic Glock 19. Pick it up off the shelf and run it. It's going to run the same way. So nothing special in here at all. Only had one part break so far, which was the valve knocker, which we swapped out. And then pieces of the barrel are starting to break off, but it still runs fine. Um, when it does completely snap and the barrel just is fucked, I'll get a threaded barrel probably. And at that point, I'm still not going to put a comp on it or anything like that. Um, I'll just get one of the darker thread protectors probably, or maybe just all black. And then that's pretty much it for that. See how worn down it is on the slide lock right here. And then, right here it's pretty worn down, and then where it actually locks is pretty more worn down as well. For mags, are on the WE mags, because they're half the price of the Elite Force mags, and they hold five or six more rounds. So they do stick out a little bit, but if anything, that just helps with the reload, getting your finger under the mag and ripping it out. Um, sometimes it'll lock back, sometimes it won't. I think mainly the reason is how worn down these two parts are. Um, sometimes the W mags will lock fine in these, sometimes they won't, but as long as you're paying attention to how much ammo you have, just checking it before you go into a room, it's really not an issue. Um, you really don't need the slide lock. It's not that big of a problem there. And then for the Mark 18, go over the upper first. So on the upper, um, same setup as the MP5, just less rail space on the MP5 obviously. You've got a vert grip that's been chopped in half. Um, I know you guys rag on me about holding my MP5 wrong, but um, I think you guys don't actually shoot, so don't really listen to that. Uh, so on the vert grip, I just grab it under here. I only need the three fingers on it, have the index finger under, and then thumb to press the buttons. Same thing on the other side. I only need three fingers on the grip. If I had the full vert grip, I'm not going to grab it like this. There's no point. And if you've shot a real gun, you know you can control it better like this than you can like this. Um, so that's why I chopped the grips. On the MP5, I didn't chop it because that grip doesn't lock in with two screws up here. It's the screw on the bottom of the grip that actually pushes a rod up and locks into the rail. So I can't chop that off or else it won't lock on the rail. But again, same thing. I'm not going to grab that grip down here. I grab the grip on the MP5 up here, wrap my thumb over the top, and you can still see the irons over my thumb. Um, here's the PEC. Um, I got this from Supply Airsoft or John Lee on Hop Up. It's got visible blue laser, visible white light, 
And this is the non-IR version. I don't have fucking nods, so I'm not getting an IR one for 10 bucks more. Um, knockoff Scout Light. Um, knockoff Pressure Switches, of course. I mean, this one came with the pack. This one, I'm not sure where it came from. Um, then you have Blue Laser on the bottom right. And then White Light on the top of the rail. Um, the wires coming out of the pack for a hop-up tracer unit. So on the G and G hop-ups or any plastic hop-ups, um, I drill them out. I'll put a hole here and then a hole here, and you put UV LEDs in them, and it illuminates your tracers as they go up into the hop-up, and then obviously you have the tracer inside of your hop-up. And then you would have the wires coming out of the front under the outer barrel. So on pretty much any gun that has the front wired option, it'll have a cutout around your outer barrel where you can route the wiring harness through. So I just use that. The wires come off the hop up through the upper out of the rail system. And then they hook up to the peck unit up here. Um, so the LEDs don't um, draw a lot of power. They'll just run off the same batteries the peck uses. And all you have to do is find whatever wire in the peck um, is activated by the laser. Um, the reason why it's the laser, I don't know if it's still the same on the newer pecks like this one, but on the older pecks, for whatever reason, wiring it into the light wouldn't activate the LEDs, but wiring it into the laser would. I think it's how much voltage just goes to each unit, to the light and to the laser. Um, but how it's set up is anytime that you put power to the laser, so if you press the switch and turn the laser on, that power also goes back into the hop-up. So if you want your hop-up tracer to work, for your BBs to illuminate, you can have the laser on, and if you don't want the laser, you can have the cover over it so the laser's on, but no one can see it, but your tracer is also on. Or you can just run the tracer and the laser at the same time, just however you want to run it. Um, Bushnell Red Dot had this on my AR a long time ago before I got a Neotech, so it's on here now, just to have it on there. Um, that's pretty much the upper, uh, the lower's over here. Uh, so this receiver set is from the Boneyard bin in the tech room. It's a PWS receiver. I was pretty happy to find that. I used to have a PWS Diablo back in the day. So it's just a basic receiver set. Um, it's been chopped from someone else way back in the day probably. Um, the Mark 18 rails were given to me. I found the vert grip and a parts bin back here. Obviously bought the peck and the light myself. I bought the suppressor off of Evike. Um, and that's it for that. It's basic stuff there. Um, standard G and G barrel, G and G green bucking, G and G hop up. Didn't change anything on that. It's a pretty short engagement distance here, so I don't need more than that for accuracy. Uh, grip is from the t uh, Boneyard too. Um, quarantine had us all really bored, so I cut holes in it so you can see the motor. Uh, the motor is a ASG U2200, 22,000. This is the 28 TPA motor. Um, this gearbox wasn't built much for RPS, it was more for trigger response. So a super torquey motor, 28 TPA, gets the job done pretty nicely. Um, gearbox shell this is just a standard g, g gearbox. We have a bunch of these in the tech room with blown out gears, blown out pistons, whatever it might be. And um, we don't usually get the chance to fix all of them, so there's always a couple sitting back here. This is the newer version with the reinforcement on the bottom. So it's good to find this one. No cracks in the shell, pre radiused reinforced here. Just needed a gearbox shell to throw these parts into. And then stock G&G &G bushings as well right here. Just make sure we don't pop everything out when we open it. And I don't think I lost any shims. So for the gearbox, we have a Gate Titan Basic. I don't need the advanced one. I didn't need the card either because we have all the programming stuff in the tech room. So I can just program it from here. I didn't need to buy the advanced. It's just Gate Titan Basic, SHS 13 to 1 gears. Um, all of the compression parts were from a bag of parts I had from a gun that I bought that came with a second gearbox. So that um, KWA Block 2 had a second KWA gearbox with it, but the wires were chopped at the gearbox shell here, here, and here. I don't really know why they chopped it, but they did. But I'll take the gearbox shell. And that gearbox also had no teeth left on any of the gears. It was completely destroyed. So I got the, so I got the cylinder from that. I got the piston. 
from our manager here actually. I got the gears from our manager here for a good price. And then the spring, the spring guide, ball bearing spring guide were also in that gearbox. Um, the air nozzle is a stock g, g air nozzle from the Boneyard bins back here. I had the max double o-ring air nozzle for a while, but I'll show you in a second. Those are super tight on the max cylinder head and it wouldn't even move freely. Um, the spring for the tappet couldn't even pull it back quickly enough to cycle the next round. So I got rid of it, put a standard one in there. Um, didn't see a change in accuracy or anything like that, or FPS either. So it's good how it is. I didn't want it to be hung up like that anymore. So I just got this one so it can actually move freely. Uh, the G&G tappet plate, it's what came in this gearbox when I stripped it out. Um, they obviously are shaped a little different to accommodate for the reinforcement here. And this tappet plate can hold up just fine, so I kept it in there. We'll open this up a little more. Um, so for the air nozzle, like I said, I had the um, the CNC double O-ring air nozzle in there before. And you can see how tight it was on there. Um, I tried to smooth it out, sand it down, remove some material. Um, even then it would not really work well. So the g, &G air nozzle, perfectly fine, moves freely. Didn't lose a bunch of FPS, obviously lost a little because there's no O-rings in these. <coughs> uh, but it still runs fine, Fe feeds fine, shoots fine. Not much FPS loss, so I'm fine with that. Um, this might be a VFC cylinder, I'm not 100% sure. And then you've got the SHS Switch Cheese Piston, full metal rack. Um, not sure what brand this was, because it was in the gearbox I got. Probably SHS, something like that, but CNC there, um, piston head. Um, you can see, uh, the gears are short struck, I'll show that in a minute. But you can see this is chopped right here. Um, what you want to do, the right way to do it, is take the piston head off, pull the rack out, cut those teeth off with the rack out that way you don't chew up the piston like I did right here so that's what you're supposed to do I didn't want to do it didn't have super glue to glue this back in or epoxy so I left it like that so yeah you should probably take that out and cut it off that way um, for the gear obviously those teeth are chopped because it's short stroked so S is just 13 to ones we took off two teeth so these first two teeth right here on the pickup side, took them off. Um, this isn't smooth at all. Obviously, I don't really care. Um, so yeah, short stroke two teeth on the pickup side of the sector gear. Two teeth taken off the drop side of the piston. Um, and then you can probably see, it probably actually looks better in the camera, maybe because of the light. But you can see the swirls right here. So when I first built this, took it to Dreadnought, posted that video, you guys were absolutely triggered by the shimming. So, and a lot of you people said it would increase your rate of fire, it would increase your trigger response if you fix your shimming, you know, whatever you guys were saying. It really won't, and I'll show you guys a picture of why I don't think it would have done anything. And I've obviously re-shimmed it by now. If you watch the newer videos, it doesn't sound like a PTW anymore. But yeah, all that was, was probably 0.2 millimeters I could have added to the bottom of the sector gear to bring it up off of the spur gear, or I could have probably dropped the spur gear down a little bit. I don't remember actually what I changed to fix that. It was just a little bit of shimming to do. Um, but it was just rubbing on here a little bit, making a little bit of extra noise. Um, maybe making the motor a little bit hotter, but it was never enough for me to notice it in a game. And you guys know I don't wear gloves, so I, I would have noticed it if it was getting pretty fucking hot. Um, so yeah, we just re-shimmed it, fixed that so that the sector wasn't rubbing on the spur gear anymore, and it's all good now. You guys can hear it in the video, it doesn't sound weird anymore. Um, so yeah, I'll show you guys the picture of the video. Um, I don't know why my motor always feels like it's gonna explode. Well, that'll fucking do it. Pretty much what it was, was the kid had the bearings instead of bushings in here. And it was his spur gear bearing that actually blew out completely. There was nothing left of the bearing besides just the internal shaft. There were no ball bearings left there was no outer portion the outer ring here it was just the shaft in the middle and it had play on either side there was nothing touching the gearbox shell and it was still attached to the spur gear somehow and the gun ran fine you would have no clue anything was wrong with that gun except for after five minutes of playing with it the kid's motor it was an asg2 it was a speed motor not a torque motor but his motor would get so hot i swear you could probably cook breakfast on it 
after barely any play. So that's why he brought it back here. I opened it up to see what was wrong with it after we tested a couple motors. All of the motors got insanely hot, a bunch of motor dust in the grip. Um, it was the bearing for the spare gear. It was completely gone. And the spare gear had actually dug into the gearbox and made a perfect circle in the shell of the gearbox. And then the hole where your anti-reversal latch actually sits had a chunk just ripped out of the side of it from the teeth on the spare gear getting pitched off to the side and then ripping through it. And the gun was a short stroke SSG, really nice on the inside. Um, and it still ran fine. It still had instant trigger response, great rate of fire, no drop shots, everything seemed fine. The only thing that was wrong with it from the outside was the motor was really hot. So I was surprised when I opened the gearbox up and saw that that was destroyed. But I think what it was, was his shimming was so tight, obviously not to the point where the gears would move, but to where the tolerance was so low that they actually held each other in place since the gearbox was under tension. And it kept the spur gear in line enough to where the gears would cycle. So obviously if you have a nice motor, tighten, all that good stuff. He also had an insanely thick LiPo battery. It's going to pull this no matter what. It'll pull the gears until it breaks or until it detects an error and it shuts itself down. Um, in this case, it didn't detect an error. Um, if it was an advanced tight and you plugged it in, you would have seen the heat was super high. Um, higher than you would want it, obviously. But yeah, the only thing you could tell was the motor was too hot. But shimming was so nice, it held it in place, kept the gearbox running seemingly fine. But then we opened it up and we saw gearbox shell had massive grooves taken out of it. The ARL hole was completely bored out. Um, but we ended up re-shimming it, new bushings, and it was fine. Um, the ARL still sat in there fine. It didn't take out enough material to where the ARL wouldn't work anymore. And um, it worked fine after that. Um, the motor still got hot a little bit, nowhere near what it was, but that's because he was running it super hard. He had a huge battery in it, and was just pushing it as far as it could go. So yeah, that's why I wasn't worried about the shimming, but I had to take the gun apart anyways. I was going to up the FPS a little, so I re-shimmed it just to make it nicer, make the gun run cooler, make it not so loud. And, um, you know, it wasn't a big deal is what I'm trying to say, but... These things will pull pretty much anything, if you can imagine that thing being destroyed. Um, and obviously there was shrapnel everywhere, all over the gearbox, ball bearings. There are ball bearings in the spring, uh, the piston guides up here, everything. So that's pretty much all the parts in it. Um, I did polish the guide rails for the piston when I first built it. Um, pretty much what this gun was, was there were a lot of things I hadn't done with building guns before that I wanted to do. Um, so I hadn't polished the rails before, I wanted to try that, see what that was like. I hadn't short stroke before, wanted to try that, see how it went. Um, hadn't done really any full builds for myself before. So we went in and did a full build for it. Just to see what it was like, because I had some money laying around. Somehow, I know. Um, so, with no air nozzle, pretty good compression height, that's as far as you can compress it. This is a full cylinder, and then if you grab the air nozzle, put it on the tap it. It's still really good compression. For an air nozzle, it doesn't even have O-rings on it. That compression is fine. I'd rather have that over the double O-ring air nozzle that was causing that. So obviously I'm going to take this one any day of the week. So yeah, that's it for the Mark 18. It's not a crazy build on the inside. But this kind of beater gun and a gun I wanted to try stuff out on. And that's pretty much it for the Mark 18 on the inside. Um, if you guys want to see the MP5 on the inside, then you're going to have to really convince me. Because if you've ever worked on an MP5 before, um, especially the old Classic Army MP5 with the BNT externals. If anyone knows what I'm talking about. Those things really are a pain in the ass to get apart. There we go. Um, it's like a clamshell on the top and then a complete lower and pull the gearbox out and then you got to Split the whole upper part to get it back together. It's a real big pain And then there's a the speed trigger in here So I have it set to where it moves this far You could set it to be less with the set screws on here But I like to still have a little bit of a trigger pull and know when it's gonna go off So that way you can prep the trigger know where your wall is and then go through it so that's it for the build. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can ask me. I think I covered everything. I probably didn't. I missed something, but that's my bad. Um, a couple things to go over, actually, if you guys care to listen to it when you're setting up a Titan. 
because I am obviously a tech here. I don't really ref anymore. Um, so one gun that we just had, it was a tad. It was a really weird thing, but something people do a lot is they'll glue these wires in right here. I'll move the bevel gear real quick. So something people do a lot of the time is they will glue these wires down right here. And I understand why they do that. They don't want the motor to come in right here at this angle. And if they're adjusting the motor height, um, they don't want to chew these up and destroy them. Obviously, it's going to throw air coats. It's going to heat up your wires. It's going to be a big pain. So they glue them down to keep them flat. But really, if you set them up in here correctly, these guides right here for the wires are going to hold them in perfectly fine. They're not going to move. They're not going to get in the way. You can see the smaller wires over the bigger wire, they sit pretty much flush. It's plenty out of the way of the motor. So you can see they're not chewed up, and this gun has quite a few rounds through it. So as long as you set it up right, you're good. You don't have to worry about that. One thing we saw, and I don't know why, it was a Lonex gearbox, Gate Titan, stock Crytac gears. This isn't a Crytac body. They had to remove this guide right here that holds your wires in place. So imagine the wires from here to here were free floating. There was nothing to hold them in besides the back of the ARL, which obviously it's not meant to hold those wires in. So they removed that, but then also your spring for the ARL, it tensions so that it can work properly off of that um, wire guide. That spring is pushed up against it right here, and that's what gives it tension and lets it interact with your beverage. Bever Oh my god, bevel gear properly. So they had removed that, so obviously those wires are free floating. So now they are getting chewed up by the motor. Um, when I opened the gearbox, they were all glued down from probably here to here. This is glue everywhere. I think it was it was hot glue in here, but there was also super glue in the motor grip for some reason. So they glued this down, but I guess they also didn't realize the ARL no longer worked. So that spring, since it can't push off of that um, guide right there, the spring isn't made to be long enough to go all the way to the back of the gearbox shelf. So the ARL was just, it was sitting against the bevel gear where it was supposed to be, but since there's no tension on it like that, it would never interact with the bevel gear. So if you wanted to do active brake or I think pre-caulking too, it wouldn't do anything because this is just sitting here, not doing anything. So I took a spring that was not meant for an ARL. I don't even know what the spring was for. Um, and I just bent it up onto the ARL so it would hold it. And then um, I had a spring that was long enough to where it would go past where this guide was supposed to be. I routed it under the wires into the back of the gearbox shell so the arrow would actually work. So don't remove that. I think if they removed it on purpose and it wasn't on accident, I think they couldn't figure out how to get the Titan wires to fit in between the guide and the back of the gearbox. So they figured, all right, we'll remove that so that we can get the wires to sit in there. But then you're getting the wires chewed up here. So that's why they glued it all down. Now, if you are having the problem where you have your wires in correctly with the guides, but they're coming out of place and they're not sitting flush, um, they're getting pushed up because there's nothing holding them in and then the motor sitting them. Um, g and has the little, um, they're little pieces of like bendable metal that you push into here and they hold them in place. Like if you've ever worked on a, G and G ETU before, they come with those and they hold them down. All you need is something in here and here mostly that can push the wires down like this and you don't need to do anything with the wires in here. It's, if you have tension here, they'll stay out of the way of the motor. It won't be an issue at all. So something for that because a lot of people will glue that down and then when you bring your gun in to someone to get it worked on, what do you think is going to happen to your wires when they're super glued to your gearbox shell and they need to remove your MOSFET or remove your wiring harness? We have to rip that out, maybe heat it up with a heat gun, but for the most part, rip it out. And then your wiring, at least your insulation, is trashed at that point. It's covered in glue, and it's going to be harder to actually get it to sit properly. Another thing with the Titan, um, when you're greasing the gears, you can see there's not a whole lot of grease on this gear here. On the top, there's barely any. On the bottom, on the axle, there's barely any, and there isn't any in the gear teeth. Um, normally, when I'm shimming, or when I'm just putting gearbox back together, if they don't have really a Titan in it, I'll put grease inside the teeth of the bevel gear here, and on the sector gear as well. Not on the piston teeth, but below that interact with the spur gear. Um, run the gun a couple times, let it cycle through, and that's how I grease it. On the Titan, you have optical sensors. You have one on the top of the sector gear right here and one below it. Those two always get dirty. If you get too much grease on that, the gun will stop working. Um, what will happen is the gun is trying to read how far the gears are cycling. It will read the teeth on the sector gear. 
So if you get dirt on that, grease, whatever it is, you put too much in the gearbox, the gun can't uh, determine how far it's cycled. So if you're on semi, I've had this happen with this gun before and others. Um, the gun will cycle on semi, shoot one shot, two shot, and then you pull the trigger and it goes three or four shots on semi, or it'll just run away in full auto. You shoot once, let go of the trigger, and it runs away. It keeps shooting for a little bit until it detects an error. It's because there's too much grease on this sensor or the one that is just across from it on the bottom of the trigger board here. So what you do is just a little bit of grease on the axles here and on the bottom obviously. Um, if you have bearings, put grease in the bearing itself where the ball bearings are so they don't blow out hopefully. And then you should be good. Um, you just have to be careful not putting too much grease on it or else it will most likely cause a problem. You'll get an error code that just says, it'll say either the gear sensor is broken, which is bad because you pretty much ripped it off. I would assume you didn't do that. Um, or you just got dirt on it or grease and you need to clean that off. Once you clean it off, it should be good. Cycle, just like normal. You just have to be careful how much grease you're putting on it. It should be good. Even if you do get too much grease, it's not a big deal. You just take a paper towel, wipe it off. The second you get that stuff off the sensor, it's good. It'll work like normal again. Really, those are the only error codes I've gotten with the Titan is just too much grease on this um, the gear sensor like I said it'll say it's either broken or it's dirty it's usually dirty it would be pretty hard to break one and if your shimming's fine you don't need that much grease and obviously a little bit of grease on the piston rails that's all they do so yeah, that's it for the gun um, if you have any questions just comment it and I'll answer them if I can I usually can you know what I mean um, that should be it it's pretty basic All right, guys, real quick, <clears throat> we'll shoot it real quick, we'll go to Chrono, and then we'll show the stats on the Titan control module, if we can. Sometimes the computer doesn't really work. So safety, obviously, with the Titan, you get rid of the safety bar itself, um, but you still pull the trigger and it doesn't fire. And then this is the set length with the set screws on the trigger. And then in the Titan settings, you can make it go off really quickly or really far into the travel. It's whatever you want based on the sensors in there. And then this trigger, you can set it with the set screws. So you're safe. And then full auto. Right, there you go. Alright, so real quick before we look at the settings. Hopefully this doesn't look too bad because I'm just holding the camera. But on a lot of these G and G lowers, obviously PWS is G and G an old one. Um, a lot of times you have to put Velcro in the back of the receiver right here. Let's see if I can hold this. You have to put Velcro in there to get the mags to feed properly. Um, I didn't want to do that. That's what we usually do. But since it's a polymer lower, I do this on the rental guns. All you do is you take a screw. You can probably see it in the light right there. You take a screw and you drill it into the back of the, the lower in the mag well. And what you can do actually is on metal mags, you screw it in as far as possible right there. You obviously want to use a flat screw head, not a rounded one. So with the metal mags, because they're a little bit thicker, you screw it all the way in before you use those mags, and it'll feed with those just fine. It'll push them as much as you need it. And then polymer mags, like the EPM ones that I use, you screw it out just a little bit, a quarter turn, and then it lets those feed properly, and it won't really mess with your mags that much. You'll see a little bit of a channel where the paint wears out, um, and on the metal mags, you'll see it a little more just because of paint on metal. Um, but on polymer mags, it's not too bad. On metal mags, it's not that bad either. But it helps the feeding a lot, and it's a lot more consistent than putting tape in the mag wheel right there or putting um, Velcro in there. And then for the uh, computer on what the settings are, I have to update my Titan real quick. So we'll wait for that. All right, we're updated now. We're in the control module on the computer. So, uh, battery protection, lipo warning, I've never really messed with that. Um, probably still won't. Safety limit, don't have that on right now. Cycle detection, that's on. Um, I think it always is on. But that's what I was talking about, the gear sensors reading how far they're traveling. And then you can select tooth or brake. Um, I don't mess with that, I don't even think you can. So just leave that where that is. Gear ratio, high speed, 13 to 1. You can change that. Normal, low, high, dual, 19. So high speed, 
close. Active break, I have it at 40% right now. Um, you can mess with that however you want based on what you want your gun to do. Um, I'm pretty sure the higher you go with active break, your motor will heat up a little bit more, a little bit faster. Um, but yeah, 40% is what I have it on right now. So not anything crazy. Uh, for the trigger, um, so it'll show right here is going to be the sensors in the gearbox that read when your trigger is moving. So if I pull the trigger, you can see the gears or the sensors moving as I pull the trigger and then it fires on that first sensor. So you can set it to where it will fire when you're at the last sensor for a really long trigger pull. You can set it where it goes off for the first sensor for a really short trigger pull. And you don't need a, an upgraded trigger for that with the set screws in it. Obviously your trigger won't stop right there like mine does. So when I pull the trigger, it stops after that first sensor because that's as far as I need it to go. Um, but you can use a stock trigger. It'll obviously have over travel into these sensors, but once you use your gun enough, you'll be able to stop it manually right here once it goes off. Um, but you don't need a fancy trigger or anything like that. Uh, Pre-cocking, I have off right now. Um, I don't I don't need it. I could probably turn it on if I wanted to, but I'm not messing with it right now. Ready fire control is off, so you can adjust um, how fast your gun is. You can obviously tune it down, tune it up, whatever you want. Selector, um, with selector you need to make sure you have the stickers on there so it actually works. So we're on safe right now, semi, auto, semi, auto. Sometimes if you have a problem with it, you'll go between semi and auto and it won't go back to semi, it'll stay on auto even if you're on semi or safe. Um, and you can recalibrate that here, you just go 120 degrees, 120 degrees in between safe and semi, in between semi and auto to get it set up right. Uh, magazine, if you have a DMR or something, you can change that, but it's all basic settings. It'll vibrate if it gets an error, or when you plug your battery in, it'll make the noise. Um, I don't know if this is accurate, but 7,800 rounds through this one. Probably is accurate, it sounds about right. And then right now, no errors, because my gun's not fucked right now. Uh, maybe something will blow up in the future. Uh, but yeah, that's it for that. Alright, so we'll do a chrono real quick. Let me get this camera set up somewhat okay. I'm just gonna put up these boxes and then I'll I'll read out the FPS to you guys and then show you the chrono. Alright, so this will be with 0.2 gram BBs, some G and Gs, and then the battery that I used before and the battery now is a 10 G 11 one 1000 mAh LiPo. And this is the battery I use in the game, so I don't have a really big crazy battery or anything like that. Two thirty eight, two thirty five, two thirty eight, two thirty eight, two forty. So right now it shoots about two forty. So the spring that is in here right now is the spring that came with that spare gear box, the one with the messed up wiring, the broken gears. I have no clue what that spring rating is, and the bucking in here is also an old G and G green, and I don't know how old that one is either. So in the future, I might up the FPS on this, but for now it's okay because it's a CQB field that's really close quarters, and our limit's 350. Um, so 240 is fine for me. I still get accuracy to hit across the field because it's obviously not a big open arena. It's a close quarters CQB, a lot of room playing and stuff like that. So 238 is fine for me. Right, and then full auto, I'll show you guys the chrono, FPS and the RPS. So full auto, we're going to be at 240.5, so the average is 240, and then RPS is 24.6. So right around 25 RPS, like I said, this was for trigger response, not for rate of fire, not for FPS for long range or anything like that. So that's what we've got going on in this, and I guess I should say... This warranty sticker is here because it says get fucked, I think. Um, so like I said, this is from the back of the tech room. So I just covered that up. It still says fucked, but you know, that's alright.